Okay. So we're looking out for. Uh, I hope it's visible. Okay, great. So yeah. sorry everyone that I didn't prepare to share, so I didn't even dress up properly. <laughs> so I will mm -hmm. not turn on my camera, but I'm going to quickly just at least make sure that you learn something new, uh, because I know it's a mixed audience we have, and um, I decided the easiest way would be let me just show you something that pretty much for everyone is going to be new and. Uh, so you probably have been hearing about all that Microsoft has announced in build, but um, it's a lot. And sometimes you go here, you go different places to get, get the information. Luckily, they have created one harmonized, uh, very detailed listings of everything. So I'm going to quickly walk us through the aspects that uh, I think you should be aware of. Okay. So you all, uh, you all know about how AI is the big thing now. And um, interestingly, I don't know if you follow stocks, but uh, NVIDIA is almost now a trillion dollar company, something that, you know, was never, nobody expected it. Their, their shares jumped up multiple, like a huge amount because they are the ones providing the GPU that powers AI based um, technologies and so it's a big thing now i'm just trying to point out that microsoft is also at the forefront of it you know they are the major people let me put it that way behind open ai chat gpt and they are really not resting so you probably must have been hearing about copilot you know it's the new rave in town as regards how as a developer as a technology user you can have uh, almost like an assistant <laughs> You know, almost like a personal assistant. Uh, what do I mean? I think I have it on my GitHub, but I'm not able to. I won't demonstrate it, but just to give you an example. So uh, you are a programmer. You want to develop, you want to write some block of, block of code to do something, right? But then instead of you having to go copy chunks, so what I used to do is I used to have common chunks when I'm doing my VBA programming, because I used to do every VBA programming. Uh, I have the codes to help me maybe cycle through all the files in a particular folder. You know, I know people when I was doing Python, I used to have a block of codes to help me do some common, common iteration, common um, uh, tasks. You know. so, what this does is you don't have to have block of codes anymore. You don't have to keep libraries of things as a programmer. All you just need to do is, you know, type it within your code block that I want to do X, Y, Z, and it will create like the, 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 it will instantly generate for you the block of code that you can now just edit some things about it. So that's on the coding side of things, but that's not just it. There's also now Windows Copilot where it's going to come up in Windows 11. And what we really do, it's you're able to ask questions the same way we ask OpenAI, but it, this will go through all of your emails and it will, it has connection to everything you have connected your Microsoft account to and is able to give you summary of your last week, remind you of, 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 of things that you intend to do or, or things. If you plan your week, it's, it's not like a AI that is now like all seeing and your personal assistant. So just ask it a question and there's going to help you to summarize all that you've done, go through your emails, your browsing history, or it can be a bit <laughs> uh, disturbing, but if you are someone who you are open to those kind of things, you know, that's what they are trying to achieve with the, if there's, there's the Microsoft 365, there's also the Windows one. So for developers, people are, those in development environment, they are very happy about it because it means that they can easily build codes or blocks. You can go to another language and just get it to the ground running. You don't have to remember too many syntaxes, you know, and you can just uh, reuse your, your existing logic. Then we have the Azure based ones, which uh, I was in a MVP meeting last, last, okay, last two weeks, I want to say last month. And you know, the one person was really all raves about OpenAI on Azure. So where, you know, unlike the unlike the public OpenAI, where you are afraid to put your own data because it becomes part of the training model. So there is the Azure OpenAI one, 
where it is going to be restricted to your organizational data. You are now within your own control. Then it's paid anyway, but then you have that data governance within your. You are not afraid that your data is going to be exposed to public uh, uh, or be used to train a publicly accessible uh, AI engine. So there is that Azure OpenAI. It's always been there, but then they made it a bigger announcement. Uh, the, the, everything in Azure now is beginning to have AI, you know, as a part of it. So I'm going to just scroll all the way down and go to where falls in the Power BI space. You should be very excited. You know, it's Microsoft Fabric. So Microsoft Fabric. Uh, let me see if I can open my environment where I have a preview access. You know, so it's very interesting because I'm able to. Let me see if I can just launch it. I'm going to drag this away so you don't see my password. But it's amazing because right from Power BI, so Power BI is not going to be like another Azure. Because that was the um, that was the experience I've been on it since February, and at first I didn't understand. It was looking really new to me. I was like, "What are we trying to do? What are what is Microsoft trying to do? Why am I able to now, you know, access other things as if I am within Azure or I am within Office? You know, when you go to Office.com, you know, you can from there access Outlook." Excel online, Microsoft online. So it's almost the same experience that this is creating where it now looks like a platform that you're able to access a lot. I'm not going to be, I don't, I'm careful not to show what is probably under NDA, but look at it. This is a live account. I've always had this account since February. So this is Power BI that I, I logged into Power BI. Look at the address. Can you see that this is powerbi.com? You know, I logged in with the account that it gave me access to. And do you see that Power BI is now just one of the two? It's no longer just uh, Power BI. Probably they will change this URL. It will no longer be powerbi.com. Uh, it might now become, um, I don't know, maybe fabric.com. But the idea is that Power BI is, a, is at the core of it. That's the thing I want you to understand. The fact that they want we as Power BI users to do more, to have more control over where our data is coming from, the data uh, processing part of it. So instead of the data engineers working in Azure and you working in a standalone platform that is Microsoft Power BI, you know, you now have one work workspace. So that's the concept. There's a workspace as we are all familiar with, you know, so there's a workspace that you can also control. The admin portal is now central, you know, so if I go to that, I'm careful not to go to things so I don't show uh, things I'm not allowed to show, but you can see that the admin portal becomes somewhere that you as a Power BI person uh, that has admin rights, because that's what happens when you are a Power BI developer within a company, you are given an elevated access rights. So you want to be able to not just build the reporting side of things, but have also ability to connect to the data warehouse, have also ability to go set up data pipelines. So if you go to data factory, you're able to, you know, no longer just consume in a passive way the data that has already been exposed to you. You are able to also participate meaningfully in the data engineering process. Nowadays, when you look at job roles where they want to hire Power BI person, nobody asks for just Power BI anymore. Before it used to be, oh, you must know Power BI, you must know SQL, and maybe know Excel. Now the it's amazing. At first, I was I was a bit frightened. You know, they don't even ask for Excel anymore. What they do is you must know Power BI. They want you to know Data Factory. They want you to know Azure Synapse Analytics. So they are beginning to ask for Power BI and Azure knowledge. Then how will you be able to know these things if when you work as a Power BI person, you don't even have access to the Azure portal where all those other you know, data factory, Azure Synapse Analytics, and um, even Azure SQL are being warehoused, you know. So what is this is achieving by my own understanding of all Microsoft have been saying, their body language and all that they are trying to push as the future, you know, that they are trying to align this with, is there will be one central place where 
all of the data engineering and presentation side. So Power BI will just be like the front end kind of, then all the way downstream to where the data is coming from, all the aggregation, data lake. You have you now heard of one lake? So one lake is their own terminology for you know all your data together, like one drive. And all of that will now be something that you as a Power BI person should be able to have visibility into number one number two should be able to meaningfully contribute to it you know you don't have to be passive and telling people something broke you know data engineers should check it because some, that's what happens where i'm working right now uh, as a power bi person when some of the pipelines break i don't know because i'm not i don't have access to the uh, azure data factory so uh, I only will know when things are not looking correct on my report anymore, right? But then with this new approach, I can be able to see end to end all the data engineering processes that is building up to the data that I'm consuming within Power BI. I'm able to access, you know, I don't know if you are familiar with what the concept of the Azure Synapse Analytics uh, environment is. It's an environment where you are able to Okay, I thought someone was asking me a question. Uh, is Tina back in? Okay, if she's not back in, I'll carry on. So it's an environment where, let, let me see how much I can open up all of this. So let me just quickly drag this away a bit and open some of it and see you, oh, unfortunately, the data have a uh, confidential data in them. Uh, so I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to I have it open up somewhere as so I have the Azure Synapse stuff open here. Okay, great. You still see my screen. So I'm going to show you the Azure Synapse. Uh, it's at the core. In fact, Azure Synapse was the, let me not say it was, it's the precursor to what we are seeing as Microsoft Fabric. What do I mean? The idea Microsoft had around the Azure Synapse is, let's go to this. Okay, do you look at my, I hope you still see my screen. So as you're seeing, it's yes. a big deal. You know, if uh, you as a Power BI person, you want to work in a company that they are big on, on cloud computing, on automating analytics processes, and they are a Microsoft shop, which means they are using Azure services heavily, they, they will expect you to be aware of Azure Synapse because that is the embodiment of the analytics side within Azure host of tools. So if you look at this explanation that as a company, as an organization, these are the different analytics you want to be able to carry out. It might be in phases. Some companies are still struggling to get descriptive out. And unfortunately, Power BI is already very well, is a, is a very great tool for this, you know, where you are showing what has happened, you are connecting to your data, and the, the people are able to see the reports, you know, very easily you know we've eliminated excel because that's the that's the enemy this day now people don't want anything based on excel anymore they want to just take out excel as as a reporting layer so that's one power bi awesome yeah you know most of us that do power bi we sometimes only stop at this so but then for companies uh there's always what's next if you've done reports that show how we are doing, our operations are moving, that brings you know full visibility to all that is happening within the different segments of the company. You know, maybe we are using the, the different methodologies that people go about with their data warehousing. Okay, so it doesn't matter which uh, maybe you're using the Kimball methodology that goes functionally, or you're using the other one that wants to like centralize the entire process across the organization. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, there's always this next question of, we are seeing what is happening. How can we be a bit more proactive? You know, how can we spot, you know, spot problem areas? So instead of me just allowing you as a human being, you know, to take a whole lot of the diagnostic, uh, you know, we've looked at the reports, then getting the insight out of it. How can I also point out to you areas that are of concern. So one of my colleagues calls it management by exception. You you want to focus on problem areas. You don't want to give the same uh, the same amount of uh, of visibility to things that are going well and things that are not going well. You want to make it easy that when I see everything that is going well, 
you know, perhaps maybe I should even first see areas of concern, then I can now dig, dig me and, and, and drill down to see other things. But, you know, I am a, let's give a very clear example. I'm an airline, you know, um, let's start with airline, then I can probably also use a bank. So I'm an airline, uh, I mean, into the aviation, I'm an airline, you know, could be mentioned anyone, I don't want to mention names. Uh, and then, you know, Descriptive is going to show you all the analytics about your flights, the platforms you use for booking, what flights, what customer behavior, how they book, uh, issues you face operationally, which flights were delayed. You know, diagnostic is going to begin to point out, okay, what are the places we usually have bottlenecks? We all know that for airlines, delayed flights are a problem because it means that uh, they're going to probably get sanctioned, they might incur costs. And they have a lot of fixed costs. So when things don't go smoothly, they're going to miss their revenue. And on top of it, they might even have to compensate client customers. So diagnostic analytics will now begin to isolate the problem parts and point it out in a in a in a in a, in a, in a dedicated visual, in a dedicated uh, report layout, you know, another report page where you are now seeing, you know, these are the the routes that typically gets delayed. These are the particular type of people that, you know, when they are the ones uh, on, on shift, things go wrong. You know, that diagnostic aspect of things where, okay, someone is asking me a question, what's the real difference between, let me quickly just open my chat. What's the difference? What's the relationship? What's the relationship between one lake and Microsoft Fabric? Great, I'm going to come to that. So uh, I even have there's an image I can use to show you what our Microsoft has envisioned one leak. But let me just quickly, you know, let you understand how Microsoft Fabric is this plus Power BI and plus data factory pipelines, ability for you to create those uh, data flow pipelines, you know, bringing data from one environment to another environment. And that's where the one leak comes in because one leak will be where all those data get to pile in, but I'll get to that uh, later. So, but this is the missing piece that most of us are blinded to as a Power BI person. We sometimes don't see that Power BI is not just meant to report the descriptive analytics. You know, you are supposed to also begin to uh, let it show diagnostic analytics, you know, and then there's predictive analytics. Uh, Power BI right now is not the best for that because uh, prescript predictive analytics requires a lot more than the kind of DAX functions. And so the max you can do with Power BI is probably into use the, the Python and have component of it. But then uh, within the Azure portal, you know, we also have Azure Machine Learning, Azure Data Explorer. So they already have things that are well tuned for predictive and prescriptive. Interestingly, Power BI at the start was meant to be able to do prescriptive. So then we used to have a button within Power BI that allows you to connect it to Microsoft Flow. Then they change Microsoft Flow to Power Automate. So the idea was that if I have a report that shows our stock level, and then I could connect it at one stock level falls below a particular minimum order level. It should trigger within Microsoft Dynamics. So you trigger an RFQ, you know, to people already registered as vendors to supply that particular product. So prescriptive was something they had in mind originally to be easily achieved within Power BI. Uh, I don't know why they didn't seem to push more about it, but then again, uh, what they are now doing right now is they have created a lot of things with the Azure Synapse that is meant to be used for prescriptive. So prescriptive, as you can see, here, is something that is supposed to eliminate human input completely. And so makes it such that uh, based on some logic, when things happen, you know, almost like when you are trying to, it's common in the financial sector. If I'm suspecting that the transaction is fraud, I'll rather flag it and stop it from happening. You know, so that is prescriptive. Uh, I am, I'm going to stop it. I'm taking the action. As so, you've drawn, you've drawn logics and built in, you know, models that are working off patterns and history of data. And when you see some pattern emerge, it takes action. It's not just, it's not just calling the transaction and saying this has a 
90% chance of being a fraud. No, it does not stop there. It's actually stopping the transaction from happening and triggering some things that will pop up on the UI for the customer that says uh, this transaction has been flagged, you know, reach out to support or send us uh, additional documentation for us to review and probably now, you know, release the transaction. So that's prescriptive, you know, uh, something that takes action instantly. Unfortunately, they are wanting to let it be handled by another uh, another set of products, no longer Power BI. So that's why most likely Power BI will probably end here for the visual part. It can also report the outcome of predictive and analytics and, and prescriptive because what happens is when you predict, right? If you predict this will happen tomorrow, when tomorrow comes, your prediction becomes descriptive any, you know. So you can measure, you can have Power BI show how accurately, you know, been predicting things and then you can cost correct, you know, and fine tune. Uh, but back to the big picture that I was trying to show us is that all of that is not going to live in one place that is going to be uh, fully accessible to you as a Power BI person. So you can now do the Power BI you've been doing, but then also have control over the data pipelines. And then uh, Reflex is something a bit new to me too, you know, uh, but I think it's supposed to help with the, look at this prescriptive and predictive. So if you look at it, it says, Monitor changes in your data and automatically take action when conditions are detected. So it will automate the action part. Then we're familiar with Lake House, you know, and all the data engineering part of the whole centralizing the data, data warehousing. And then as come to predictive, they have this other as your synapse data science that is going to be heavily dependent on on um, on Azure Data Explorer. You being able to use Python cost cost so BigQuery in Google, the, the, the replica for Microsoft is the Azure Data Explorer. And so you're able to do big data analytics and predictive at a very uh, crazy fast speed, you know, not at the relational database level. And then you have the natural Azure Data Warehouse, so your SQL relational DB, but then, you know, fine tuned for performance. And then you have real time analytics, you know, like things for letting you capture uh, streaming analytics. So all of this, the entire possible kinds of data you'll be working with and manipulations you'll be doing, we now be warehoused in one environment. And so that is what Microsoft is doing. So what about the one lake we are talking about? I think I I once opened, uh, it's just that I've closed it before today. I had so many things open. So let me see if it was here. There is a place. Oh yeah, this is it. So see what one lake is. One lake is, is just another word for, if you ask me, uh, lake house will have been the right word, but then what Microsoft is doing is they are almost following the Kimball approach where you could have lake house for different business segments. You know, If you're a con conglomerate, right? You could have a lake house for one subsidiary, another lake house for another subsidiary. If your business arms are really, structured as business segments. You could have different lakehouse for different segments. And if your reporting needs are uh, usually different and processes different, you can have lakehouse for every major uh, functional aspect of the business. So what then that means is that uh, you probably have more than one lakehouse. <laughs> so that's why uh, it has now become, okay, you, you we now have a one lake where you can have different lakehouses. You can have warehouse let me tell you something when you hear lake house right originally it started as a in fact it started as blob storage it started as something where you have a folder online that's that's the funny thing you know is as if i have a folder the same way we have a folder on our pc so we are just saving data saving data whether it's image whether it's voice call you know audio whether it's text you know, that's the idea of a folder. You can save any kind of data, unlike um, DB where things are a bit, the DB we expect you to specify structure ahead and keep following that structure as you design ahead. But for a folder, I can decide to save another type of files type that I've never, that never existed when I was creating the folder. So that was the way I'm trying to explain what lake house, you know, so that sometimes you yell this grammar and so you, you, 
you begin to think that this must be completely new. They are not all really new because Lakehouse was folder in our computer. You know, there may be folders in, you know, when you were in a company and they are all, you are all using group folder, you are all using a shared folders. You know, that used to be very popular 15 years ago, you know, where you connect to the network and then you're able to access those, uh, those folders will come up as another drive within your, your PC. You see, you see, oh, this is a network drive. You know, that's actually, that network drive is the lake house we are talking about. But let me just uh, begin to say it gradually. And then cloud came into place and people decided to start to have it as something much more that you are buying it as a service. And then for Microsoft, it was now like Azure Storage. Then in the Azure Storage, we began to have, okay, there will be blob storage. Then there is now, uh, there is now uh, ADFS, ADLS, Azure Data Lake Storage, you know, and then ADLS Gen 2. Then ADLS Gen 2 became now Lake House, you know, then there's Databricks, but that was the core of Lake House. And then nowadays, they expect you that somehow you should use more of columnar storage for texture, for, you know, data that are not video and the rest. So you now have packet files really living now. So pretty much everybody is expecting that when you have a lake house, you're using more about this columnar storage for fast data retrieval, and you can now write the, write the equivalent of SQLs on them. So uh, back to all of this, the idea is just that, just keep dumping your data. Don't worry about structure, but then people are beginning to expect some logical, uh, logical, logical separation. Let me put it that way. So the same way on my own computer, I have I have my C drive, I have my D drive, you know, I have my flash drive, which is another drive. I have different drives. So it's the same concept. So you are now having different leaks, you know. So one lake house can be for like to see a customer related transaction data, customer related data. Then another lake house is for uh service telemetry you know so different accounts for different functional aspects of the company and then what will be next is one leak is now the embodiment of all of this so we also have warehouse warehouse simply still expects you to be sql based relational database so you still keep having your db you still keep having all the oltp and all the uh traditional uh relational DB based system. So you will have those dedicated SQL pools and they will be the warehouse, you know. So SQL, non-structured data, lake house. So just think about it in that way. So everything together, you know, across the organization will be one leak. The same way one drive is across your company. So that's why probably I'm calling you one leak. So across the organization. So probably this will be something that will be managed at the most central place. You know, you have a global IT system, right? In the company I'm consulting for right now, we have a team called Global 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 Tech Team. Let me use that word. So they manage access across all of the companies and tech resources. So what will happen is if you are working in the Toronto office in a particular unit, you might have your own lake house. UK office and department might have their own different lake house based on uh, the way the business is structured. But then there is this global body that administers the entire, you know, so it will be one leak and ensure that the uh, things are having the company-wide data governance, people are having, things are working going smoothly and they too might create some level of reports that can be accessible to all the business uh, subsidiaries, you know, at regional level, at, at HQ and all of that. So that's the concept of one leak, you know. So from the one leak, you can begin to, carry out all the other data needs that you, or transformations and all of what you want to do, you know, you can begin to, but now with a unified management and governance. So that's the way I I see one link as different from, different from what, what was it you asked me, is it different from? Okay, different from, uh, so Microsoft Fabric, one link can be seen as the, as the platform at the data level. Why Microsoft Fabric is both that one leak and the analytics you do on top of it, you know. So Microsoft Fabric is in one way built on top of one leak. If you think about it that way, so one leak would be something 
that will be a part, a part of the Microsoft fabric. Uh, I don't know if people have other questions. Okay, so by the way, any news from Tina? Um, no, no, no news from us so far. Almost time is almost gone, so I will carry on. Uh, okay. Anybody has questions? Uh, any questions? Can I ask a question? <laughs> if you want to unmute and ask, also feel free. Unfortunately, okay. I will have lots of, if I click on this, you will see different things I've okay. done, but these are things that Microsoft data, what I used, and they are under NDA. So that's why okay. I'm careful not to click okay. them. Awesome. But the thing is, there is more power to us as a Power BI person. They want to elevate our role and relevance within companies. So okay. we will no so longer be... Oh, okay. Hello? So we will no longer just be passive users of data will be heavily involved in the data engineering process. So maybe into the future, as a Power BI person, you will not just be a BI, you will also be a data engineer. You know, you will need to have some knowledge of this because what is now happening is it will be a it will be an, a, a harmonized platform. So data engineers that probably used to support Power BI people, they too might be forced to want to now learn Power BI so that they will just have the full uh, full bouquet of, of skills. So it won't just be separation of concerns. Some people know how to do Power BI, some people know how to do the underlying data engineering that needs to happen. So it will now be okay. something that they expect you to know everything, you know, or at least be aware, even if you are not going to be expert at everything equally. It's 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 more requirements on your part, but also it's more interesting because what it means is that uh, you you are no longer building just reports you are now becoming more involved in the in the etl on the on the that used to be part of what was happening on the azure portal you know data factory the pipelines the other pipelines when i was on a project for another canadian company they were we were going to do power bi as the visualization for the operations but with we we're going to do prediction and then power bi we now display the result of the prediction and show them what will go wrong. So we had to use Azure machine learning. So I had to build a, I had to build a model with Azure. It was easy because it was drag and drop. Uh, I thought I was going to write a lot of query of, of Python, but I found out that everything was already there. I just needed to set things, drag things, arrange the processes well. So it was really interesting. So I did that part well, but then we are getting data from different uh different they were actually inverters solar inverters fast and coming like millions of data every day so what happened is someone else had to set up the azure data factory to ingest the data save it as packet file save it in a particular a folder for each type of inverter type so different inverter types are different way their data was coming the telemetric data was coming so what happened was we set that part up then I now points Power BI to. You know, so I, I did two things. I point Azure machine learning to that to that um, Azure data uh, to data lake. So it was inside the data lake. So I point the Azure machine learning to the data lake to pull in the data, you know, from there and then use it as the input data for the model that I've built. And then I set up some some scheduled uh, some scheduled uh, compute processes that we now do the prediction based on that data and, and save it also again in the data lake. Uh, and then, then it was data, yeah, data lake ADLS. And then Power BI now connects to that data lake and pulling the data that we include both the um, actual data and the forecast. And so with that way, I was now being able to do like some heat map to show failures and point of failures. It was really interesting. But what happened is I needed, they now had to give me access to Azure. So before I only had access to Power BI, but now I needed access to Azure portal. So with this one now, you will no longer need to ask for, ask for separate access to Azure. All you need is just from your Power BI, you will access everything. And then the resources will be warehoused together here. They will know what expenses is being incurred for this because what used to happen is they didn't even know at some point they were complaining that some things were running 
and incurring cost. And they didn't know, they were asking, Mikey, are you using this? Then they will go back to the other guy and ask him, are you using that? So with this one is a separation of concern. They, you, you know which one is being used, the resources that are being used on the Power BI reporting side are now fully you know, housed in this separate environment. So back, let me see, I see Joshua has a question. If anybody wants to say anything, time is almost up. You know, please feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you, we will unmute you. How can a data analyst learn? Awesome, please help me unmute Oluwa Toby. So I'm reading Joshua's question. How can a data analyst learn this data engineering aspect? Where can I start? But nowadays, I find out that the easiest way to learn this new technology from Microsoft is to go through the documentation Page. Let me see if I can get us the okay. link of it. So uh, Microsoft is doing a very amazing job keeping the documentation accurate. So what happens is even when you pay for courses or buy books, Microsoft is changing things too fast. No book can catch up with you know the the the, the rate of change. And then the Microsoft has, is paying people to dedicatedly you know, keep the documentation accurate. There's a army of both international staff and MVPs and, and influencers who are constantly monitoring and contributing. So I always tell myself, <laughs> and now I'm telling people that, you know, don't just think of going to buy some course or book because the truth is, except maybe you have identified one part that you are struggling with, that is just, maybe I have identified that in part I'm struggling with DAX. I can go and buy a DAX book, but if I want to learn Power BI as someone new, I would advise you to just go to Microsoft Learn, you know, the documentation. And this case now, if you want to learn Fabric, this is the best place. If you want to learn data engineering, just go there. You will even get certificates. You will get coupons to do practice. So I always tell people to do that first. Then when you now identify a path that is just proving too difficult, you now want to really master. You can go and maybe pay for some expert focus training on that one. Otherwise, when you are trying to get your feet, you know, steady, just uh, you will get everything I think you need from the Microsoft documentation. So, yes, the person who's on is up. Let me just go look. Yes, please, Oluwa uh, Toby, you have to unmute yourself. We've made you a presenter, but you have to unmute yourself. It looks like you. All right. Uh, uh, good evening. Yes, good evening. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thank you guys for organizing this. It's so amazing to hear from industry experts. I would just like to ask, how can we connect to you via LinkedIn or Twitter and how we could leverage opportunities to um, access um, um, internship room? I'm just currently starting my data analytics um, um, I've learned um, Power BI for, about few, for a few weeks, but not really, really strong in it. So I just want to um, see how we uh, ask how we could connect with you and then um, go, go from there. Thank you so much. Okay. So I have an answer, but the answer can always be improved on. So what I want to say is we're open to any suggestion anyone has to the house as regards, you know, because it's a recurring question that I'm always ashamed of the answer that I always have pre made but the answer is based on past experience so what i want to say is if anybody you know is um has the same similar question you can email us email us at i mean as the same interest email us as team i'm typing it you know and i'm going to tell you three things but like i said this answer can evolve you know if someone can help us out with a way to structure it we are open to it because it's not there's no you are not stealing our business there's no there's nothing for us to lose and if done right probably we will gain too so now back to the answer we i have three and three segments of the answer number one is that so far what we have as a way for people to connect with us and learn from us and 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 benefit from us are these webinars these webinars and maybe those who take our training they get after training support, but let's leave that out and say, since that one is a paid stuff, let's you know, leave it aside and say, okay, what is the thing that someone who is not is not training wants to come for? He wants to just, you know, be able to intern or collaborate with us, or is there a way? So uh, right now, what we have is just these webinars we run every Sunday. So we make it easy for us to share our knowledge, bring in other experts, share their knowledge, you know, connect, ask questions, learn bite size, take the 
if we do some demo, take the demo file, go and practice on your own. So that's what we currently have running. Now, what is it that we don't have? We don't have, we have an internship program, but that internship program is much more to support university students. So for me, I remember I, when I graduated in 2009, I got a job, I did NYC 2010 because I graduated like December, I also didn't help. They almost gave me extra year, but at least I was able to still catch up and not miss too many months. So I did NYC 2020, 2010 and then I was ready for the job market 2011 and I was lucky I got a job, but I, I got it with, a, with an international firm, Nokia Siemens Network. Some of the people that uh, I was that were hired at the same time, some of them schooled you know, outside the country, they did their undergraduate degree outside the countries, maybe one or two had masters to outside the country, UK most of the time. And it was amazing that, you know, me, I'd never really, I didn't know Excel, I didn't know Outlook. I, it was like I was starting on the on a, on a plain slate. I didn't know so many things apart from the book knowledge and the curriculum that they used in my university that has been the same for maybe 20, 30 years. So, uh, I was at a disadvantage, you know, I knew theory, but all the, I was making funny, funny mistakes, you know, even in Outlook, you know, and all, so many uh, things, even in Excel and PowerPoint and all of that. So that thing, we saw that our university systems are still lacking, especially when you go to public, you know, government universities, and that's where the bulk of us go. You know, so what we just did is, at least from our own side as data analysis, what can we do to help students to overcome and be better and not have that problem too, as many as we can. So that was the way our own internship was structured. It was just structured to help students. It wasn't structured to help uh, people out of school. So we are very picky that we only pick, you need, pick and it's only one person we can even pick at a time too. So only students. And but the only thing we do is we make students, we give them free training access and some other things. So we don't have internship that is tailored to maybe people making a career change or people starting out in the career path and wanting to learn this. Uh, we used to have before, but the problem was uh, we, that's why I want you to email us and tell us if you know a way around it. So we have some major problems. Problem number one is we deal with clients where it is their data that's their it's more, even more important it's a very sensitive thing you know so we sign nda it's implied even when we don't sign it confidentiality clause they, they are having the peace of mind is in the fact that they will not see their data suddenly somewhere and university i mean and interns and people who are working with us on a very um how we i put it like there's no no something binding us together that way it's very difficult for us to make our confidentiality and all those other things be binding on them so uh that one makes it very difficult to bring someone external in and begin to involve in in those uh you know consulting and all maybe training person can follow us as training assistant but there's no value in if that you can easily learn on youtube and better than just following us around for training so it's more in projects where you get value and unfortunately we have that problem where we can't just you know bring in people and give them exposure to our clients data and not run the risk of somehow breaching the confidentiality and 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 uh, ndas and other things so that's one problem the second problem is consulting before a company will come to ask us for help they won't bring the simple problem it's always the tough problem so what is happening is we are struggling to even understand the scope which sometimes they will not tell you this full scope you have to dig deep so you are facing you'll be given very tough projects and then time they don't they always want it is when it's too late before they get consultant so they want it like yesterday then we now have someone who wants to learn on the job he's probably not coming to our office every day he wants to do it remotely he, so how are we going to do it? Are we going to go and learn and, and do meetings back to back to late evening? We're struggling to try to meet up with client timeline. And then we'll not be teaching you how it is being done and be, you know, like helping you, which it has to be that way, except you already know those things. You can't really be able to plug and play. So another operational problem that makes it very difficult for us to see is value sometimes what the stress of trying to bring in someone as an intense one. So, oh, 